How's it going, guys? This is going to be hopefully a very quick uh, lesson on how confederation was achieved. So it didn't just miraculously happen. Everyone came together and boom, confederation was accomplished. You need to think back. There was compromise involved. There were disagreements about certain things. So it was it was a complicated process of getting uh, confederation achieved. So let's talk about that think back to the last group project that you were assigned at school what challenges did the group face how were everyone's perspectives taken into account how is the group able to make a final decision confederation dealt with all of these same questions bringing people together to unify a country was a great feat so the first was the charlottetown conference in September 1864, representatives from Nova Scotia, PEI, and New Brunswick were planning to meet to discuss a maritime union. And when the news of this meeting reached the province of Canada, John A. Macdonald and other pro-Confederation leaders asked if they could attend. The conference was held in Charlottetown, PEI. The Charlottetown conference was the first of three sets of meetings held between 1864 and 1866 to discuss and debate Confederation. Some of the objections to Confederation you read about earlier in this chapter resulted from the Confederation debates. Newfoundland was not represented at this conference. Colonies in the Pacific Coast region were not central to the discussions of Confederation at this time. Through lengthy speeches and many arguments, politicians from the province of Canada and the maritime colonies discussed the idea of a formal union. So look at the photo in figure 2.23 it shows delegates, representatives elected or chosen to act on behalf of others at the Charlottetown Conference, taking a break from the discussions. Compare this photo to the painting in the chapter opener. What similarities and differences do you notice? Women at the conference. In addition to the daily discussions, there were various social events held during the conferences. The leaders, wives, and their unmarried daughters and sisters often attended the many dinners and parties. At the time Confederation was being discussed, women could not vote. So refer to figure 2.24 and 2.25. Do you think the presence of some women at, conference, at the conference events was adequate to establish their collective voice in the decisions being made about Confederation? So. The wives and daughters, they were dancing with the politicians. They were able to communicate their thoughts and ideas. So it says here by Carmen Nielsen, Mount Royal University, a comment from Professor Nielsen, Calgary, Alberta, September 21st, 2015. What primary sources did Nielsen use to research the role of politicians, wives and daughters during Confederation? So she says, although women were part of the formal decision-making process that resulted in confederation, some politicians' wives played informal roles. Male politicians' letters show that they discussed confederation politics and their political decisions with their wives. Letters and diaries also suggest that politicians' wives and daughters were included in social events during, for example, the Charlottetown Conference. At these events, women's social skills could be put to use to build friendships and goodwill among the delegates, which were necessary for the men to be able to work together on the Confederation project. So basically the women were able to plant ideas and play a mediator role and help uh, communicate the ideas in a more informal role rather than during the actual conferences when they were discussing politics. So then the Quebec conference happened, and by the end of the Charlottetown conference, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI had abandoned the idea of a maritime union and considered a union with the province of Canada. But now all the leaders needed to work out the terms of confederation. So a second conference was held in October 1864 in Quebec City. Representatives from Quebec, uh, Canada West, Canada East, and the Atlantic colonies discussed and debated the needs and wants of the colonies. The Maritimes wanted access to new trade partners in British North America. For this, they needed a railway to move their goods. PEI wanted a ferry system to have better access to the mainland. It also wanted a solution to land ownership issues so tenants could buy their own land. Canada East wanted special rights for religion, education, and language. 
Johnny McDonald of Canada West wanted a very strong central government. He drafted the majority of the resolutions, decisions reached during the Quebec conference. Examine the report in figure 2.28. Why do you think historians would want to preserve the dr this draft version of the report rather than keep the only final clean copy? Well, I think it's important as historians, you can see the progress, some of the uh, disagreements, uh, of confederation and how they came to reach an agreement. So the framework of the Dominion of Canada, the Quebec conference established that the federal government would consist of two houses, the lower house or house of commons representation would be based on population size, smaller provinces such as PEI would have fewer representatives to brought and to provide some balance. The upper house or Senate would be based on regional representation. This meant that there would be more equal number of members from Canada West, Canada East and the Atlantic colonies. It was agreed that the federal government would be responsible for Indian affairs. It would absorb the debts of the colonies up to a maximum amount. It would also control all major sources of revenue, such as taxes related to trade. In return, each province would receive a payment from the federal government to help cover expenses. At the time, the payment amounted to 80 cents per person. So the outcome of the Quebec conference as a result of this, only the province of Canada, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia agreed to join Confederation. PEI and Newfoundland were not yet convinced that the union was in their best interest. So read George Brown's words about the results of the Quebec conference. Of the regions involved in drafting the Quebec resolutions, which region does Brown imply will hold no power? All right, Convence, co conference through at six o'clock this evening. Constitution adopted. A complete reform of all abuses and injustice we have complained of. Is it not wonderful? French Canadianism, French Canadianism entirely extinguished. Which region is he thinking that will imply that he's implying will hold no power? Well, it's it's Quebec. He thinks that they're not going to hold any power, and that we've gotten rid of the French Canadian element. Because remember, he wanted the French to be assimilated. He wanted to get rid of that French culture. And then, lastly, the third conference was the London conference. And with the list of resolutions drafted, the Fathers of Federation representing Canada West, Canada East, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia traveled to England to write the British North America Act. This legislation would officially end their status as an individual British colonies. They would be joined together as a united, partially self-governing country by an act of British Parliament. The London Conference, which took place between December 1866 and March 1867, is represented in figure 2.30. Why would creating a new country out of the colonies in British North America require a legal act of the British Parliament? So why does the British Parliament need to give them permission to create their own government? Well, it's because they were all British colonies and just like the intro to Confederation video, they are putting their big boy pants on and they're becoming their own nation. So lastly, the Dominion of Canada. On July 1st, 1867, that's Canada Day, became known as Dominion Day. And this picture to the right shows people gathered to hear the reading of Queen Victoria's proclamation. In it, she declared that the province of Canada, now split into two provinces, Ontario and Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia were officially united in the Dominion of Canada. John A. Macdonald was appointed Prime Minister on July 1st, 1867 and was elected to the position a month later. Queen Victoria also knighted him for his role in forming the new Dominion. Agnes Macdonald, Sir John A. Macdonald's wife, wrote about the impact of July 1st. So read figure 2.33, what does Agnes Macdonald indicate life with the new Prime Minister of Canada might be like? So she says, the new dominion of ours came noisily into existence on the first, and the very newspapers look hot and tired with, its, with the weight of announcements and cabinet lists. Here in this house, the atmosphere is so awfully political that sometimes I think the very flies hold parliaments on the kitchen tablecloths. So she's basically saying 
This house, this house that she lives in, eats, sleeps, and breathes politics. In both Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, Queen Victoria's proclamation met with protests. Many people believe Confederation was pushed on them due to their lack of voting rights. Read figure 2.34. What other voices may have been missing in the decisions on Confederation? So Confederation was a political deal between an exclusive group of politicians, all male, all property owners, and all of European origin. Though the new country was created out of the traditional territories of First Nations people, no First Nations people were involved in the discussions or consulted on the deal. Despite this, Confederation granted the federal government control over Indian affairs. So there we see again that Confederation did not consult with the indigenous people. They had no part in the decision of creating the Dominion of Canada and all control over Indian affairs was given to the federal government so they could decide what happens to their land and they can decide what happens to them. And as you heard from the, the podcast that we listened to about the Indian Act, they did not have any right there was, a, there was not a lot of freedom given to the indigenous population. So my question for you is, which person or event do you think was the most significant to the outcome of Confederation and why? Is it George Brown? Is it Johnny MacDonald? Could it be the wives and daughters of the men at the conferences that ultimately led them to reach an agreement? Tell me why. All right. And that is how confederation was achieved.